Welcome to the Genesee Valley chapter of the Adirondack Mountain Club. I'm glad you guys have come. Um, hopefully you all had a chance to get a, to look at some of the campers out front. That was a great demonstration. I appreciate that quite a bit. Thanks to all those who brought the campers. They're probably still out there, but thank you for, for lending your time and your camper for our use. Uh, I'm Dave Nichols. I'm the chair. Uh, it's great to see several people out here. We're going to have a few announcements and then we'll get on with the program shortly. Uh, first up is Gretchen. Hello everybody. I uh, brought some maps from Montezuma Wildlife Refuge. There's hiking out there. If anybody hasn't been out there, it's a very huge um, resource in upstate New York. Um, and they're cost a dollar. Jackson has them in the bookstore. And I also brought some cards for people if they're interested in joining the Friends of Montezuma. And the only things I can think of right off the top of my head, I'm sure there's other things uh, that the Friends offer, but they get a discount at the uh, refuge store. And um, they get, you get postings of what's, what the wild, what the bird life is going on out there. So it's not expensive to join. I don't remember what it is. So, if you're interested, he's got some cards over there, too. To... Thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. Next up, Reiner. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Reinhard Salmeyer, and I'll be leading an introduction to backpacking trip this summer. Okay, it's the last weekend in July. Uh, three days, two, uh, two nights out in the field. We'll be hiking a section, uh, backpacking, I should say, a section of the Northville Placid Trail. And relatively easy backpack, you know. Um, I think our maximum uh, total mileage is around 17 uh, miles, something like that. Uh, so it's designed for folks who, you know, maybe if you haven't done a lot of backpacking or if you're a hiker and you haven't, you've thought about maybe you'd like to give backpacking a try, uh, this trip might be appropriate for you to come on. Okay, um, so um, information is in uh, the Genesee in terms of how to contact me. We will have a pre-trip planning meeting, the date and time of that to be determined, but we will have a, uh, uh, a pre-trip planning meeting. We'll, we'll go over gear and you know expectations and so forth. So if you think you'd like to give backpacking a try, uh, let me know. Okay, I am limiting participants to uh, six. And I, right now I got one person who's a definite, and a few other folks have said maybe. So if you think you are interested, uh, please contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Rich? Thank you. So how many of you people have been to an outdoor expo? Okay, I see a lot of people that don't know what they're missing. So it's coming up on June 11th. And I'm asking for your help in two different ways. One, we could use some more volunteers. What we're just asking for is a couple hours doing odd jobs, nothing really terribly physical. And the other thing is, if you notice at the membership table out there, there's some flyers for the Outdoor Expo. The people that know about the Expo don't need them, but there's a lot of people out there that don't know about the Expo. So if you would be willing to take them to the local library, coffee shop, whatever. Please pick some up and take them with you. Uh, we just ask that if you take them, you distribute them. But take as many as you think you can hand out. And we'll see you on June 11th. Hey Rich, just another suggestion and thinking about that. I, I haven't put out the flyers yet, but share, share our F Expo Facebook page to your Facebook Line, so everybody, my family will love it. Everybody get that from Larry? Share your Facebook page about Expo. When you see that on Facebook, share that with others so that we inform those who aren't familiar with Expo about its great benefits. Uh, I have one other, I have one announcement. Uh, we did have our first bicycle outing this past week, we had eight people go out and enjoy the, the beautiful day biking along the canal, picking up some ice cream along the way, 
It was really quite a bit of fun. Uh, in order to see future bike outings, and we will have a few this summer, please keep track of the ca uh, events calendar uh, on our website so you can see uh, new ones that are coming up. My wife is asking to talk about something. Well, speaking about bike events, uh, our partner and I are planning one for May 22nd. Now, it's not going to get in the Geneseum because this is last minute planning, but we are scouting the bike ride on Friday. It's the Lehigh Valley Trail, and we will post it to the calendar. It's going to be on Sunday, May 22nd, and it's probably going to start in the morning. It'll probably be a 10 to 12, 10 to 1 type bike ride, and it'll be a 15 mile ride. But we'll be posting the locations uh, after Friday. Okay? Just wanted you to know about that. So look for it if you're interested. Thanks, Jill. Okay. Jackson, do you have anything to announce? Nothing to announce? Okay. I think that's it for announcements, so Katie, you're up next. Hi everybody, I'm Katie, I am the Programs Chair. Sorry, I am the Programs Chair, Katie. Um, tonight we have Mark Belides with us, and um, Mark is a runner. I know we're mostly hikers, but um, Mark is going to talk about his run across New York State, 584 miles on uh, end to end on the Finger Lakes Trail, where he set the fastest known fastest known time or FKT record um, in uh, an amazing 15 and a half days. Um, even though he's a runner, he promised that it will be more about his adventures than not running. <laughs> so please welcome Mark. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Katie said, I am going to look at this more as an adventure run rather than just a run. We're not going to be talking about mile splits and whatnot. Uh, let me escape this and restart my timer here so I know how long I'm talking for. Give me a second. All right, back in action. Again, this is an adventure, and uh, I'll bet a bunch of you are probably familiar with Yvonne Chouinard, uh, founder of Patagonia. He said, uh, it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. <laughs> uh, I did not have a whole bunch of issues throughout this, but there certainly was adventure. Um, a little bit about me. I live south of Buffalo. If you've been to the Eternal Flame Falls uh, in Chestnut Ridge Park, I see a lot of nods here. I live very close to that. It's about two miles from my house. Uh, I've done over 15 marathons and 25 ultra marathons. That's anything over the distance of a marathon, 26.2 miles. Yes, I have run Boston. I've done 600 plus mile races and 500 kilometer races. That's 62 miles for those who need the help. Uh, and I've done dozens and dozens of both self and unsupported runs of 25 to 50 miles, many of them along the Finger Lakes Trail. Uh, so for the Finger Lakes Trail Conference, we'll talk about them a bit in a minute, I am involved in a variety of ways. I am a trail maintainer down in Little Rock City area, a really cool area outside of Salamanca, Ellicottville area, while we're checking out. I write the trail running column for the Finger Lakes News. There's a couple issues over here. Please feel free to grab some. I'm uh, a relatively new member to the mapping team. I do some GPS recording of the trails for the mapping team. You've probably seen photos of mine and not even realized it. Uh, recently minted FLT ambassador. Uh, very active within the hiking Western New York community. Uh, it's a relatively new group, but it is huge. They do a lot for the Finger Lakes Trail. There's a challenge that the organizer puts on against the people out there, a variety of trails. There will be a Finger Lakes Trail area challenge this year as well. It's a nominal amount of dollars, and he doesn't make money off this. The uh, proceeds go to a variety of outdoor organizations, of which the Finger Lakes Trail Conference has been lucky to have been the recipient. For the Finger Lakes Trail, I was the 503rd person to complete the main trail. That was last year for this run. And in addition to that, there are a variety of branch trails that run north and south off of that. 
Not a lot of people have finished those. I'm only the 112th one a couple of years ago, but I don't think it's more than 125 now, give or take. Uh, on those branch trails, probably have unsupported and supported times for two of them for fast enough snow times. You may see my trail name as Quadfather, <coughs> the Godfather. Uh, I run the Buffalo Trail and Ultra Runners group. We don't have a huge uh, momentum like here in Rochester. Trails Rock is a lot of good stuff going on. We, we don't have that scene, but uh, I'm the guy for that if you're looking for anything out our way. I do spend a lot of time outdoors, not just running, but also uh, do some backpacking and camping, not as much as I'd like. I spend a lot of time hunting, fishing. Uh, there's a bunch of antlers sitting over here. I spend way too much time looking for those every spring. Uh, there's also some ice climbing tools. That's one of my other hobbies. Uh, been involved with uh, advocacy for ice climbing throughout both Zor Valley and Superior County Parks uh, with the Access Fund. Uh, all right. So the background photo here at Downsville's and it's a Catskills. It's one of the uh, the only cover bridge on the Finger Lakes Trail. It was one of the first towns I came back out of nowhere into. And it was really only after two three days. It was kind of odd to return to reality, if you will. So what in the world did you do? This is typically how this conversation goes. Uh, although the trails give or take 580, 584, 586, 590, you see all types of numbers quoted. and we'll get into that in a, why in a minute. I ended up recording about 595 miles with 97,000 feet of elevation gain, not change. Uh, for comparison, Everest is 29032, it's, it's grown three feet in the last couple of years. Uh, the Adirondack High Peaks, if you do all of them one fell swoop, 160 miles and 67,000 feet of gain. For the FLT, that breaks down to a little bit over 37 miles a day and 6,000 feet of climbing. Uh, if you're familiar with the maps, two to three maps per day. So it was a total of 15 days, 12 hours and 10 minutes. No, not normal. <laughs> and yes, this was a big deal. Uh, this was a run but are hardly running six minute miles out there. And uh, I dropped a lot of LSD. I'm sure you're all familiar with long, slow distance, of course. Um, but it was a run, but when you're looking at this type of distance over those amount of days, and this type of trail, and the route finding, and the footing, I was aiming to hit 20 minute miles. And for a hike that doesn't seem that crazy, but over that duration, that's what these things break down to. Uh, this is another bridge, or so you think, on the Finger Lakes Trail. This one's relatively new, but these actually are not bridges. Uh, so much of the trail was very wet, so this is what we call a skating rink. A lot of these were treacherous, but this one's actually very nice. It's just uh, east of Seneca Lake. Uh, there are a variety of these throughout there. All right, what is an FKT? An FKT is the fastest known time uh, for a particular route. The route's got to be something that people are interested in and would want to repeat. The Finger Lakes Trail did not have one previously, but it was long overdue for one. Some of the branch trails, Letchworth does have recorded one. I have not recorded the ones that uh, I have for both Onondaga and Crystal Hills. Uh, but there was none for the main trail. FKTs are not races per se. People could do them at their leisure, but they could happen during a race. Uh, there is a website for this. It's as authoritative as it gets, and there are guidelines on there. We'll outline some of them here briefly, but you can go into a little bit more on there. Uh, the important part here is that the clock starts at day one, right when you set off. And it doesn't stop until you're done. It's a running clock. When I went to sleep at night, the clock was still running. So styles, there's a variety here. Uh, unsupported, there is no one out there. You are all on your own. You carry everything. You can refresh from water on the thing, but that is about it. Given the length of the Finger Lakes Trail, I doubt we will ever see one. Uh, Self-supported, 
there was a FKT set in self-supported style this year. Means you can use postal drops, uh, you can carry your stuff along the way, purchase things, you can stop at hotels, but you don't have anyone external helping you. Uh, Ryan Levering is the one who just set the FKT for that this year. Uh, 21 days and 14 hours, it's, it was quite an impressive feat. There was someone who'd done it just prior to him, Art Zeminski, I forget his time, uh, 25 days, he just happened to also go this year. I don't think he was gunning for an FKT though, from what I gather. And then there's the style in which I did it, which is supported. Uh, you can have as much support as you want. I had a crew following me along with car, um, and they were able to provide me with resupplies and stuff. We'll get into what they did a little bit. FKTs have gotten big. Outside Magazine just bought the Fastest No Time website, uh, I think a month, month and a half ago. Uh, a lot of elite athletes, that's what they do for, believe it or not, fun. And uh, there are, I want to say over 6,000 routes in the U.S. that have been recorded. Uh, if you, again, if you visit the website here, it'll have all the stuff listed. All right. So what is the Finger Lakes Trail? Uh, the map here, we'll use the pointer thingy, Majigger. Maybe we won't. <laughs> the main branch of the Finger Lakes Trail. The main branch of the Finger Lakes Trail is predominantly west to east from the New York Pennsylvania border in the Catskills and Allegheny State Park on the left hand side of the screen here, all the way over to the top of Slide Mountain in the Catskills. The terminus previously on the eastern side was shorter than that, but it's been there for several years now. In addition to the main branch, there are branch trails that run predominantly north and south off of it. Uh, starting on the furthest west and in the orange here, this is the conservation branch. It runs from the Niagara Falls down to the border again. Uh, and when it hits the Niagara Falls, if you were to cross, you would join with the Bruce Trail. The bottom 60-ish miles overlap and run concurrent with the main branch, the Finger Lakes Trail. East of that, Letchworth Branch, beautiful trail. I'm sure folks here are familiar with that. The next one over is Bristol Hills. Uh, and that's another very nice trail, great shape. South and east of that, running down just over the PA border again, is the Crystal Hills Branch. That's the newest one. Uh, Interlochen, and then the Onondaga Branch. So the Finger Lakes Trail also runs concurrent with the North Country National Scenic Trail, 4,600 miles all the way out from North Dakota. We join it and share with it from the New York PA border up to Syracuse-ish, and then it follows along the Onondaga Branch Trail, and then up into the Adirondacks, and some of that is still getting hashed out, but ultimately up to Vermont. So the Finger Lakes Trail, some of the nomenclature can get a little confusing. Confusing, excuse me. The Finger Lakes Trail system is what encompasses all of that. Often though, the Finger Lakes Trail is what folks consider the main trail, that 584-ish, give or take miles from running east to west. All said and done though, the entire system comprises about 1,000 miles worth of trails between the main branch, the branch trails, and then some shorter spur and loop trails. Uh, the, the amount that runs concurrent with the North Country Scenic Trail is about 500, 420 miles. The Finger Lakes Trail classifies itself as an eight foot path. Uh, and that is, they tend not to they focus on just foot travel only. There's, there's not a lot of mixed use. You may find some areas here and there depending on the local land management agency where mountain biking is allowed, but for the most part, there's no equestrian or mountain biking use on the, for most of the trail. Uh, it's comprised of a variety of public and private lands. About half of the trail is on private land. There's 700, give or take, private landowners. And, and that matters because sometimes parcels change hands. They sell, a landowner decides they may want to start hunting that year. They may no longer want folks going across their land. So the trail does get rerouted from time to time. Uh, and 
the trail, even on some of the area that this group maintains, I, I haven't been on the current section of it because it has changed since I went through previously. There's only about 20 folks a year who finish the entire trail, uh, not necessarily all in one fell swoop, but uh, just over bits and pieces. Uh, the FLTC is the governing agency that maintains the trail and everything about it. So FLT is slightly different from the FLTC, which is the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Uh, this trail does not see a lot of traffic again. Uh, it's not like the Appalachian Trail. Uh, the entire time I was out there, I'd be surprised outside of say Watkins Glen, where it's very popular, if I saw 10 people. It, there's just no one there, which is nice. And the organization is in its 60th year. All right, this is a section above, literally above the Canyonsville Reservoir. Looking up in the distance, you can't see the tower, but the Rock Rift Fire Tower is up above this. Uh, I won't read the breakdowns here, but if you want to eyeball them over, this is uh, what each of my day-to-day -day breakdowns were. If you're familiar with the FLTC maps, the, the maps run from the west to the east from map number 1 through 34, and this is the axis points, each of the mileage, and the amount of elevation gain that I did each day. I ran east to west with the idea that it might get a little bit easier getting away from the mountainous Catskills, but if you kind of look here, it didn't really taper off. So that was a little bit of a surprise to me. So we talked about the entire Finger Lakes Trail system. Well, ADK GBC actually maintains a section on the Finger Lakes Trail. Uh, on the west, so this slide here shows the distance that I covered the day that I went through the section. I've actually been on essentially the GBC, ADK GBC section three times. The first time the trail went down through Shaman Park there, uh, that changed. When I did my main run through, it didn't go through there. It was north of that. And then since I did the run in September, the, the trail doesn't go through there anymore. So I now run, so it now runs up above a uh, hot dog road or something funny and the uh, Econo Lodge up there. I have not been on that section yet, so I will probably have to come back and do it. Uh, the section is memorable for me for a couple of reasons. Uh, I ran a 50 mile run on my own through here. I uh, ended up stopping in Hornell at the Wegmans. That was my turnaround point. So I remember that quite a bit. The first time I went through here, uh, west of Upper Glen Road, there's a big exposed field there. There's a 90 degree turn on a dirt road. And I remember a storm rolling in behind me. And I wasn't sure I'd be able to get back through there on the way back. The lightning was a real concern. So that gave me a lot of pause. When I ran through on the trail for my, my run, uh, it had a couple memories for me too, very distinctly. Uh, because I knew that Wegmans there, I, I, would, I had a hankering, it was a very hot day, uh, Black Coast and Tower, and I knew we could get dairy-free ice cream there. <laughs> so my, my little brother was crewing for me at the time, and I sent him off to get the ice cream. Boy, was I looking forward to that. I was absolutely baking in the sun. And I met with him back up after I expected the ice cream, and he was acting a little funny at the time. And he handed me something, boiled eggs, hard-boiled eggs. I, I don't know what it was, but I looked at him, and it was not the ice cream. So where's the ice cream? And it turns out there was someone very upset that my brother was wearing a mask in there in Wegmans, and he was blocking the ice cream cooler, and he's trying to tell me all this, I don't care. And we got in a little bit of an argument. And uh, this is a big growing moment for the two of us. So I left unhappy, he left unhappy, but he went to Wegmans, he picked up the ice cream for me, and the next time I saw him outside of Kankadia Park, he had my uh, caramel coffee fudge, dairy-free ice cream, and it was absolutely wonderful. And I ended up having about it. I think my second longest day out there, it helped tremendously. Uh, I do remember also Bald Hill on this section. Uh, when I talked to the FLT coordinator for you guys, 
She had thought I was a little rough. That didn't bother me one bit. But I do remember getting eaten alive by bugs the time I went through here on the run and also getting a little bit off the track. So the left arrow here, if, outside of Kankadea Park, uh, is where the section that ADK GDC maintains starts. And then it runs for about 10-ish miles, give or take. And uh, Upper Glen Road, or maybe it's Lower Glen Road, is the eastern end of that. Um, Beth is your steward. I did get in touch with her, and she asked, if I knew any young, energetic folks who were willing to come out and do trail work, I think she'll take you guys too, though. <laughs> there are two dates coming up for additional trail work, and that's June 4th and October 1st. I'm sure you're all aware of Beth's contact info, but here's her email address for her. And there has already been one day on the trail that was done as a group. Um, so please join Beth. I'm sure she'd be happy to have more people out there. All right, so planning and training. How big is that text up there? All right, the big thing for me, I spent a lot of time on the trail getting ready for this. Uh, I did over 1,100 miles just last year in preparation. I did about the most western 200-ish miles, both out and back. And then I had also scouted further sections east around Syracuse and the eastern terminus. Uh, the familiarity that that gained me really helped with both speed and making turns and sometimes the trail may not always necessarily be the easiest to follow on the FLT. And as I came west from the east hand side, I figured I would be, get tired as I went and it would be more challenging to navigate. So having spent so much time on the trail, I think paid off big time. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with training for 100 mile races. That's <laughs> the, the training for this was nothing crazy compared to what I'm used to on a relative basis. So it, it was about that with some additional core work and some mental focus and strength training. So, so what is 100 mile training for, for a 100 mile trail race and tail? Well, this time I hired a coach. I've never had a coach. Uh, I was looking for someone who had familiarity with the FLT and the endurance type of thing, and also maybe FKTs. Uh, we'll get towards uh, the end, we'll show a photo of him. Uh, Nathan Hawkoff, and he's college cross country. He has the FKT for co-ed, unsupported, Northville Placid Trail. He was wonderful. Um, ran up to about 75 miles a week, and then again, core, mental, and strength training was on top of that. And then there was hiking in there as well. Uh, a typical weekend of training could be 20 to 25 miles on the trail on a Saturday, and then same thing again on Sunday often. Uh, I did so many hill repeats with a backpack full of a 20 pound log in the dark, in the rain, the storms going on, I, that stupid backpack it was with me all the time. Uh, I, I cut out all alcohol on January 1st of that year. Uh, it wasn't all that hard given the pandemic and not seeing people, and this was fairly secret, so no biggie. And then, when did I start? September 5th, and that was for a variety of reasons. I wanted to get as much training as I could throughout the year. Uh, the cooler temps I was hoping for. The weather did not break until the, literally the drive out there. I don't do well in hot weather, so I was a little scared. Uh, luckily, I was blessed with so much rain to cool me down. And then I work at the University of Buffalo. So I needed to squeeze this in after the August semester start. It's a very busy time for us. But so much of the trail, because it runs across private land, many of the, the private landowners close the trail for hunting seasons, both right now for turkey season and then in fall for the variety of bow gun, lake gun. Um, when I was planning this, there was no early uh, antler season 
but September 1st is when they announced that, and that was a little bit of a scare to me starting September 5th. Fortunately, the areas that that applied to were only in the sections up north of the trail. Otherwise, that would have been a real last minute scare. Uh, and then I, again, I chose to head east to west and being fresher for the, the more mountainous Catskill areas, the familiarity with the trail, and I came west, and then also crew considerations. Uh, there are a variety of people involved with this, and it would be a lot easier to get those folks closer to home. All right, so I spent so much time looking over the maps from the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. There's an interactive map on the website that was by far my go-to resource. I poured over days and days and days and days. I did have a little bit of a scare there where the website went down for a couple days, right? Prime time planning. My heart's kept the bait there for a while. Uh, in addition to the interactive map, though, there are also a variety of resources too. There's a pink binder over here. It might be worth thumbing through afterwards for any of the folks that are interested in it. Uh, it contains elevation profiles. Oh, there's the pink binder. Uh, I'm, I'm used to having a preview of the slides coming up, so I'm going a little bit off memory here. The elevation profile, oh, do we have one quick? Okay, we don't. Pretend you remember that image that you just saw a minute ago. The, the, the interactive uh, website contains elevation profiles that break down how much climbing you might expect between various access points. And I found that to be a very valuable tool to very quickly look at and see what I was getting into for the next section. The crew could also look at them and get a quick idea of how long it would be for me on the trail compared to what they might be driving, which it might only be five miles for me, but it could be 50 for them. And if it was super terrainy, they could get an idea of that as well. Uh, those were the quickest and easiest to digest. The FLTC also provides GPX files. These are electronic information from, I loaded them on my watch. Uh, we'll go over a slide on that in a minute, but that was by far the, the most important piece of gear that I had out there and it helped me move very quickly. The, there are also geospatial aware PDF maps. You can load them onto your phone and then use a GPS aware map app like Avenza or Gaia or a variety of them. I did have all of those loaded onto my phone. I only ended up referencing them a time or two. It's just not an efficient way to navigate when you're trying to go quickly. Uh, and as I studied all this stuff, I also recorded all these issues and I've since joined the mapping team and, and they welcomed me with 100 plus issues that I found with just miscellaneous stuff here and there. And we've been correcting those and updating maps as we go. Uh, it was difficult to plan though, not knowing, I've never done anything like this, what can I sustain on a daily basis? I, I made a rough guess, 50K a day is 31 miles. That on its own, on any given day, is no big deal, but walking helped. <laughs> So, I didn't know how much of the trail. We ran out of power up here. I didn't know how much of the trail I could really sustain day after day after day. So, I couldn't really lay out a plan for what to expect and where I might stay on the night. I had several days laid out early on, and that added pressure actually because I had to hit those points. Initially I had, we had planned camping the first night. Um, I had a little bit of a navigational issue that particular night that put me in camp well after dark. Uh, that was not anticipated. It was an eye-opener though. 
that I really need to pay attention if I'm going beyond the minimum plan in that particular day. Uh, aside from that, I did have two other navigational things we'll get into in a little bit. So that was day one was planned for camping. Day two, I think we grabbed a hotel quickly, but there aren't a lot of options out in the middle of nowhere in the Catskills, and they aren't necessarily easy to get to either. Uh, I think days four, five, six, and seven were the next, and the only ones actually that I had pre-booked ahead of time. Uh, my college roommate has, his parents had a lake house not too far outside of Syracuse, Hatch Lake area, and so I needed to get there in time to meet him. He was not a camper or anything, so I had to have something planned ahead of time for him. I ended up with an Airbnb outside of Virgil. Uh, and we were there for three nights. That's how long he'd been crewing for me, it was planned. But that was challenging because the first night I had to kind of anticipate ending a short distance away from it. The next night I wanted to end up around it. And then the third night there, not too far away from it so that I wasn't wasting time driving 60 miles to some place to stay. And it actually worked out really well. I was very fortunate. All right, give me a second to get re-situated here. several times. This time it was early morning and the pink in the sky was gorgeous. The time I had been through the prior was at night, or the last time anyways. When I passed through earlier today, it was a normal time of day, but at night I had gone through here. And this is one of the highest elevations in the area. There's, there's nothing up here and the stars were just overwhelming that night. But the white blaze is indicative of the main trail blazing along the FLT. So my daily routine. Well, get up about five, give or take. I throw on just my running socks, shoes, vest, and load up whatever needed to go into the car. Grab breakfast and eat it on the ride to the trail. <clears throat> so most of the time those were cold breakfasts. We'll get into those. And then I would always start by hiking for about two hours. And then I'd run slash hike the remainder of the day. I'd meet my crew every couple of miles, probably five, six miles, and I ate, and ate, and ate, and ate, burrito ate the machine. Uh, hopefully, I would reach what was planned for the day and get in what I called some gravy miles, anything beyond that 31 to 35 miles that I was anticipating for. Uh, those were just pure bonus miles, and I, I really enjoyed those. Once I got to the end of the day, I heat up probably a freeze-dried meal over a jet boil or something at the car, and I would eat that on the ride to wherever I was staying for the night. And then I'd have another dinner when I got there, a real one, a big one if I could. Shower, most nights. And then I would always go to bed in the gear that I was going to be wearing the next morning. It would save me time getting dressed and whatnot. And then just lather, rinse, repeat. 16 to 18 hours a day for 15 to 16 days. This photo here, uh, this is the Reuter area, map M22, about the out selling. I had been coming through an awful storm. I remember seeing the storm blowing in and writing in a register that day, I hope the weather holds. I think I screwed myself over by writing that. Shortly thereafter, the thunder and lightning came in, and the freezing cold rain it was so cold. Luckily, though, that passed and the hail came. <laughs> I remember hankering down under a tree looking at an old quarry and being real hesitant to run through that for fear of the lightning. But eventually, I did get through there, and I suffered some more miserable miles after that for a little while, but then the storm broke, and the steam was rising off the trail, and the sun was coming through right as the golden hour hit, and the rays like this were unreal. 
probably was only out there for five minutes, ten minutes. I may be the only one who's ever lucky enough to go through and see that. And it was by far the most wonderful, favorite part of the entire trail for me. How am I surviving out here? Uh, again, I only ran into about ten people on the entire trail. Two folks were end-to-enders that were through hiking. Uh, this one morning I ran into one whose trail name was Garlic, and it was probably 6.30 in the morning, and here I come, trancing through in my shorts and my little vest, and he's barely got his pants on. I said, don't put them on in my park, don't worry. And he just looks at me, he says, where are you coming from? I said, oh, the Catskills. Map 22 is quite a ways away from map 34. <laughs> He's baffled. He's, how, are, how are you surviving? That was all he could get out of his mouth. And I mentioned the crew at that point. So food. It was a never-ending burrito eating machine. With a variety of crew throughout, I didn't want to put the onus on them of making food and cooking food and, and picking stuff up. So I had them as each of them joined me they came in with stuff from Chipotle, uh, non-tastic, which I haven't had. It's a fast eating and casual restaurant. Uh, I love their stuff. We have one in Buffalo. And then Core Life, too. So uh, the Chipotle got a little old, not the greatest in the world, but the non-tastic of Core Life, that's good, healthy food. And I was able to get a variety of stuff for that. So they would stuff that into burritos, wrap that into tin foil, write a love letter on it for me, for a while, anyways, we discovered that the Sharpie they wrote the love letters with would get on my hands, so we had to stop that. And they would send me off with the burrito in hand as I'm eating, and another one in my pocket. And I'll bet I ate eight, ten burritos a day. And they never got old. I was a little concerned about what my stomach would do, but the variety of foods that I had, it worked out well. And then as the crew joined, they would always come with fresh stuff, too. Uh, I, I love hot dogs. I got any of those that here. But I did not have a single hot dog along the entire trail until the very end, where uh, my crew member cooked one over a jet boil for me. Definitely not the first time that's happened. Um, so the crew followed along in my car. This was a good day for my car. Inevitably, stuff was wet all the time, and drying it was a big challenge for the crew. I did have some portable shoe dryers with fans in them that were DC based. They didn't work, not efficient. Uh, paper towels in the shoe just didn't work. But if we could get a sunny day with the breeze, it worked with wonders. Uh, we did also try treating the shoes like potatoes. We had them wrapped in foil at one point. That uh, didn't work either. I did have a variety of clothes, but I only had a, a finite amount of shoes. I think I had five different pairs on me. One was a road pair. Uh, the others were trail shoes. Uh, there's two pairs over here on the table if you're really curious about what they were. Managing the feet was a big deal keeping them dry. I had many pairs of socks. I think I had 20 over there. I did not have enough clothes, though, to wear something fresh every day. So I was fortunate. The Airbnb had laundry there. A crew further out west, he grabbed, he came out for one night, grabbed my clothes, washed them, and came back the next day. So I was pretty lucky there. Gear-wise, this is a typical photo of me. Uh, You can't see them down below, but there's trail running shoes. I also wore a short set of gaiters every day. Those are the leopard print things over here, the tiger print rather. Uh, dirty girls, they're probably popular amongst the hiking community quite a bit. Uh, I'm absolutely drenched here. This is typical. You can see my poles in my hands. I, I use them quite a bit. Uh, there wasn't a single time I did not carry the poles or use the poles or have them attached to to me. Uh, these are black diamond carbon fiber poles that fold down. They're over there. Well worth every penny in my eyes. Uh, around my waist there's a hip pack. If I wanted to I could break down the poles and fold them and attach them to my back. 
In there also I carried a soft flask water filter. Instead of a hard bottle, it, it's, it's much more comfortable on you. That's over there as well. Some toilet paper, some backup water filter, water treatment tablets. And I think that was it for the hip pack. And then on top, I had a vest on. And this, these are very popular amongst distance runners. This is pretty much what everyone wears. I did not use a bladder in the back of that. They are a pain in the butt. They are slow when you're out running and trying to change them. You can't determine how much fluid you have left. And the nice thing, instead of that, I had two soft flasks up front. You could have two separate liquids. So one would always have just pure water in, and the other would have some type of electrolyte-based drink. In addition to that, on my left hand side, and both the slide and my left hand wrist right now, you see my watch, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, I had a Garmin in reach up top, a small safety kit, some arm warmers, which were great instead of a shirt that you'd have to take the entire shirt off to go from a long sleeve to a short sleeve. You could just slide the sleeves off. They're over on the table here as well. Uh, and then probably a rain jacket, which I did wear from time to time as well. The hat I ended up with here is actually the same hat that the self-supported fastest no time guy wore. I found that by chance. And then my phone always on me, so you'll see photos. All of these photos are from the run, from my phone, with the exception of one or two. My feet, this was pretty common. This was day in and day out. Uh, it wasn't always like that, though, but even on sections where there wasn't standing water, the Finger Lakes Trail passes through farmer's fields left and right. You're inevitably going to hit sections, even on a dry day where your feet are wet. It's just the way it was. It was no fun. So I would have hours and hours and hours of wet feet every day. Would swap out shoes throughout the day, most of the time into dry shoes, but not always. Dry my shoes off, dry my feet off in between the best I could. Let's talk about runnability a bit. So this was a run again. I broke down the time a little bit earlier, aiming for 20 minute miles. Uh, again, this is how the trail looked like. This is the not pretty section of slides here. We'll have lots of pretty photos but we'll kind of breeze through these just to give you an idea of a lot of what's encountered out there. Uh, this is kind of Adirondack-like conditions, not, the, not far off the summit slide mountain. This I actually don't mind running at all. It's solid. You can see where your foot strikes. This was not far super inviting. I wasn't terrified to go in there at all. I was waiting for a creepy clown to be waiting for me on the side of this. Uh, this is harder stuff to run through for me. Greasy, slippery, wet leaves, mud. Uh, that's ankle breaking stuff in my eyes. A lot of this, these, there's plenty of thorns here, overgrowth of all different types. I wish I could convey the smell in this particular area. This was a blast too. Some of these old access roads and whatnot. It's shoulder high thorns and ferns. You can't see the ground, and sometimes there's logging remnants underneath. Those are slow going miles. Uh, stained metal. So much of this that time of year. And I had shorts on the entire time. There were no pants to help with that. Uh, Japanese knotweed, a little thick at times. Again, just a golden rod, ragweed, and of course there's more knotweed here. Both of those had lots of bees. This is why I remember going through this section. Uh, this is outside Cannesville Reservoir, and just hearing the buzz of the bees was crazy. Can't run across this too fast, though it is nice to stab the mud. More thorns. Now, this is the photo I was in previously. That's actually the trail straight ahead. I'll see it, right? <laughs> this is below that on the trail. Another skating rink covered with stuff. Just mud. Um, luckily, I crossed this. I wasn't going down this. There are sections where you are going through that. I was quite surprised. I 
uh, this is outside of Syracuse. I had been to here just weeks prior, and there was no sign of this clear cuts. There were about three clear cuts. I had no idea they were coming. More mud, fun, fast moving. You know, there's skating rink. Can't smell. And my legs were constantly full of burrs and whatnot. It's really insane. So I'm reaching down, picking them off, and they're just loading back up as I went. That, that was irritating. You can see the gators here on the feet with the shoes, keeping at least the garbage out of the shoes. This is thorns. That's overhead high. All right, let's breeze through that. So navigation, I mentioned uh, I use the watch quite a bit. When going across the trail, speed and accessibility of that are very important. Getting out the maps and the phone, just, they work, but not fast. The other thing too, when you're moving at a running clip, you make a mistake, it gets magnified real quick. Suddenly, five minutes down the road when running is three quarters of a mile. So I ended up using the watch that I'm wearing here with the electronic files provided by the Finger Lakes Shell Conference, though I had to edit them. Uh, the watch was wonderful, by far the most important piece of gear. Haptic feedback, it basically it would buzz if I got off trail. It would tell me if a turn was upcoming. I could have uh, nutrition reminders set in there. This is the watch here. We can see the heart rate at the time, the hours of the day, the distance. Here's a variety of screenshots on the top left. It would break it down on a per climb basis. I could see how much climbing and what distance for that climb. I had each of the maps broken down in an individual watch file. And you can see the overall profile for that on the top right. How much climbing on that section done, how much remains. The red arrow on that screen shows me which way I'm going. And the bottom left, this screen is for, interesting for a variety of reasons. Not only is it telling me I got a turn at about 500 feet, but it shows the underlying maps that are built into the map. It shows the trail in red, which way I'm facing. And then the name of the road here, the crew learned if they saw anything that's an old CCC truck tower, they might be in for a surprise when they got on it. So this particular old CCC truck trail, that was a nightmare road for them for sure. Uh, with the watch being so important, though, I, I did have backups. One of my crew has the same watch, and we had all the stuff loaded out of there. It worked wonderfully. Like I mentioned, the elevation profiles. Uh, here's an example of one. Uh, in some sections of the Catskills, it's not blaze all white. And the elevation profile shows you what the blazing colors are, and then the breakdowns between sections. Uh, okay, I did not use the PDF maps much. The car here, this is my car here. We drove out, my one crew member and I. How, but, was, uh, how was the battery power on your watch? I mean, how long did it last? I get about 30 hours of GPS use out of this. It's a Phoenix 6 Pro, uh, but it, I did have the luxury of recharging every night. The nights where I didn't have plugged in power, I had a break with me to charge off of. Uh, this is my car. My first crew member and I drove out to the caskets with it. And I didn't know when I'd see it again. It was in his hands after that. The photo doesn't do it all that much justice here. Uh, it was apparently buried in mud afterwards. He met me at the trail at this point, and he, it was easy hiking up the mountain. He discovered there's really only one summit. But coming down it uh, bifurcates, and he didn't go the right one. It was in a little bit of a rush. And he said the mapping program put him on an interesting road, and he was very close not to getting the car out. The look on his face confirmed it must have been serious. <laughs> So crew, there's a lot to ask for people, and I'm not used to asking for this much help. I uh, said, let's take three weeks, so I involved eight different people, didn't end up using all of them. It was during the week, and then the crew had to overlap to the hand gear from one to another. So you'd almost double at the tail end of each of them. And I couldn't tell them where I'd be because I didn't know how far I'd be going. And we might not have cell service then. So I brought my buddy, John, that some of you had dinner with a short time ago. Uh, he's experienced crewing, very technologically capable, and he was with me for a week. It was, he was huge. I can't thank him enough. Uh, in the Catskill areas, there's not a lot of cell service. We had an inreach, Garmin inreach communicator, but it's 
it has its nuances. It might take 15 minutes to send a message out of the woods. It might take another 15 to receive. And if you want to reply, you need to double that. So we have developed a little bit of a protocol where he, when he would get to an access point, he would at least send me a message that he was there, and then I could receive that when I received that. And if I got somewhere and he wasn't there, I, I'd at least know. It wasn't real quick and easy for me to be messaging either. And we're not back and forth texting. That was what we were out there to do. But we did have one, mostly for emergencies. Um, so we had two, and that's why they're here. Uh, it's sitting over on the table if anyone wants to look at it. So what did the crew do? They would occasionally leave me and go get new ice, water, gas for the car, make sure they didn't run out of gas, because we were out in the middle of nowhere a lot of times. They made burritos for me, sometimes wrote love letters. They would prepare both themselves and me for the coming sections. They'd have to tolerate me and my smell. And we would have to figure out on the fly where we might be staying that night. And then also figure out with the next crew where they were going to meet them and how they were going to coordinate that. And I had to leave that up to them. I couldn't deal with it. But mostly they just made fun of me. <laughs> this is the back of my car at one point here. It chopped here, not the greatest photo. The Yeti cooler, expensive as it may be, was huge. It worked really well. There's some variety of garbage food here on the left. Uh, the crew, a lot of them had never seen the Finger Lakes Trail, and it can be difficult to navigate, so I had to teach them. Uh, and all of camp, as I mentioned, we did have a big Zoom meeting prior where we went over this. They encouraged them to load all the resources onto their phones and whatnot. Um, but that didn't completely happen. So the big pink book over here, they all had that, that off between each other. And then my first crew member, he had a spare phone where he had all the electronic info loaded onto there, and he handed it between each of the crew members. My little brother phone, the biggest useful map app for the phone, though, maps.me, you could load a GPX file or KML file of all the tra trail uh, access points, and then just simply click on them, win offline, and then navigate from spot to spot. That was by far the most important thing for the crew. It was amusing. They would often if I'm on a trail that they'd be facing the wrong side and for me to come from the other direction. Uh, my buddy John was unreal, so was the crew, all of them, but they picked up my mother to finish. They had her flowers, and my car got washed after it looked like this. And they even had fridge food for me, because I planned on three weeks of not being home, so there was no food when I got home. One did end up catching COVID. Fortunately, he was one of the ones I didn't utilize, was lucky there. Uh, it's not all just luxury having a crew, though. A self-supported person can stop wherever they want to for that night. We had to get wherever we figured out earlier in the day and stop there. And again, I had to teach these guys. I think a motivated, self-supported person could take a good dent out of this FKT, logistics-wise. Logistics is what makes FKT. Uh, this is not what the crew was like all the time. The first week, I, I had asked them to put out a chair. The first week, I noticed there was no chair, though. And when my second crew member came, he did have the chair out. He was sitting in it when I got to him the first time. And I immediately sat down on it, and the look of horror on his face, <gasps> John told me not to leave the chair out. My first crew member knew I'd sit in the chair. It was tough love. <laughs> this was the last day, though. I think I earned the chair at that. Uh, this is typical FLT, farmer's field, pretty sunlight at the time. So how did I fare? Well, they're good. Success. I got the FPT. Zero blisters. I, I, very proactive with my foot care and management of the feet. I've, uh, of all the 100 miles I've run, I've never had one. I didn't fall once. I came close once. There's about 30 loads of dump truck dirt middle of the trail and I'm almost bit it, but no. And then I think I developed an immunity to stinging them. <laughs> the bag. Oh, I was so haggard. This is me a couple days after we finished and went did some work around and I just looked so thin and just beat to death. Probably lost about seven pounds. And that's eating burritos constantly. 
Uh, my legs looked like I had tried to baptize a cat. <laughs> I tipped the tooth. I, I got me. I I never bothered telling my group. And then I developed something called Christmas toe. Uh, a lot of through hikers look at this, where they're hiking throughout the summer and the fall, where their toe will go numb, and they won't get feeling back until about Christmas time. I've had this before, though. And several months later, the feeling came back. Well, my shin was the biggest issue. Uh, four or five days out, they really started hurt. Three days out, I was in pain. Two days out, I finally started taking some ibuprofen. I've been real leery of any NSAIDs uh, in endurance running. There are some concerns with that. But it was time at that point. Uh, I was limping the last day really bad. But even two days out, 75 miles in, I figured I could crawl if I had to. It's <laughs> ridiculous as that sounds. The last day, though, there were two very acute moments where I really thought I tore something in my shins. Uh, the one went away, and I kept going, and then came back, and I was able to get through it again. It did take me, I don't know, two weeks till I was walking normal afterwards. I didn't run for a while. Um, and then I was really cloudy head when I say that. It was very difficult for me to write summaries of this afterwards. Even my end-to-end -end article for the FLT News that I wrote weeks later, it was going to be really hard. This thing beat me up. It was hard. I'm still slow from it. I am running now. This was a major undertaking. Um, and not just physically, but mentally, too. You, you really never know what to expect out on the FLT. One moment, you'll see this, and it's gorgeous, but then you'll have to swim through this for half a mile. And over and over and over, that was, that was hard. I once wrote that it was west of Swain, and I remember writing, it was a full valley adventure. It reminded me of everything I loved and hated about the FLT. Surprisingly tough road climbs, loose dogs, navigation challenges, cord, field edge bushwhacks, butterflies, dragonflies, damselflies, and plenty of deer flies. That's the FLT to me. The finish, if you read my end to end article, you probably know it was not the happiest thing in the world. I had been following my watch, and that had worked wonderfully. So I had an idea of what I thought remained distance wise. And I'm counting down five miles, four miles, okay, it's coming up. Three miles, mile and a half. Wait, wait, why is the finish here? There was an error with the, the GPS file, and I reported it earlier in the year, and it hadn't been fixed on the watch. So all of a sudden, I was done. It was just this abrupt finish, and that was really hard for me to process. And imagine you're running a marathon. Maybe that's a little more relatable. 26.2 miles. You get to mile 25, <laughs> sorry, just kidding, you're done here. <laughs> Except that marathon's 600 miles long. That was really hard for me to, to wrap my head around. I still struggle with that. And then, not perception-wise, it didn't seem like there was much interest in this. I'm so stoked that you folks are out here listening to me. This, is, this was awesome. There were some Facebook posts here and there, but barely anyone said boo, and I, I was baffled. Why is that? Is it the relatability of something like this? Is it? She's been there. <laughs> I don't, I really, I don't know if there was a stigma around the way it ended. I don't know. And, and trying to bring that up made things worse. <laughs> so this is more I'm fond of here. There's, there's this idea that trail runners are blazing through the trail and six minute miles and they don't appreciate the little things or smell the roses. Well, this little thing was about an inch and a half long. I saw it there, tip us out of the lake. Speaking of the roses, this is a rose of Sharon. They don't smell, but I did stop to smell it and take a photo and then proceed to get blocked by the train in Brain Ridge and crawl through for the next 20 minutes. I do love the found rose in the spring. Like right now, it's awesome out in the woods. There are not a lot of them out in September. Uh, this is white, bangberry, doll's eye. This is my favorites. Don't eat that. 
Pink Malamusk, one of the few out um, at the Game State Park. Uh, Aster. Loose dogs. <laughs> so when you're a runner, like you're an attractive to dogs. They look at you a little bit different if you might be squeaking by as a hiker. Uh, believe it or not, the little guy on the left here was the aggressor. The German chapter, okay, let's go bug him. They followed me for about half an hour. Uh, another little guy had bent my heels, so I tons of them. <laughs> Salamanca. This guy wanted a piece of us some time. I was worried we were going to get attacked, but he came out. All you want to do was get petted. Uh, I stepped on a snake. Never done that before. Wasn't this one. This is a smooth green snake, only the second one I've ever seen. Prior to him around the corner was a ringneck snake, the first one I'd ever seen. And just prior to that was a kestrel that landed on the telephone lines above me. You looked down, I swear he winked. Well, now he was out eating snakes, is what he was doing. A lot of other dangers out there. <laughs> Bite your head off. I came up with my brother at one section, and he wasn't looking down the trail, he was looking down the road. It's because every time he would look away from these goats, he would sneak up on them. <laughs> you gotta watch out for these. Now, that's no horse. That's the most foul and terrible animal you've ever set eyes upon. Uh, here I am, 575 miles from the trail. I see this horse, and I go to pet him. And uh, some other horses came over. He let me pet him, but when the other horses came over, he hip checked them on the way and proceeded to bite me. <laughs> I have a good buddy, the FKT holder, for the long path, and he does not like horses. So that my first thought was, oh, he told me so. This was my second thought. I don't know. <laughs> oh. Well, if you're not familiar, that's Blazing Saddles, where Mongo knocks the horse out. There were some friends, though. Uh, this is a red after the adult stage. You don't see him in this phase too much, right along the trail. Not the only cow I have photos like this. Um, and then, in addition to the, the western terminus coming abruptly, there was also a raccoon carcass at the very end. So this is your friendly western terminus raccoon carcass. <coughs> I did get bit by yellow jackets twice. The first time was on the arm. I said, oh, great. I don't have to worry about running. That doesn't really affect me much. Well, 15 minutes later, he got me above the ankle, and that itched for days and swelled up real good. I somehow managed. You saw the photos earlier. No ticks. I don't know how. I did have, I did, my troubles, clothes were not treated. I did have stuff for me, but I didn't end up putting it on. It would have been a hassle. I didn't see any bear. Um, I've never seen a bear on the FLT. On the last night before finishing, I was eyeball deep in a bag of pretzels. My buddy crewing for me casually says, hey, did you see the bear? I'm not sure I believe him. <laughs> we were hunting later that year on his property and a bear wandered past though, and he made sure he got photos of that one. Uh, Time-wise, I'm at about an hour here, so I'm gonna skip some and get to some thank yous. All right. I mentioned my MVP crew member, John. He had dinner with us earlier. This is the photo of the dinner folks probably heard that he was terrified might be involved here. I it became a game sometimes sneaking up on the crew. And again, maybe facing the wrong direction. This is probably six in the morning. But that's not fair to John. This is what John did. And that's the big pink book over here, the adventure phone that we used. He's teaching my college and my eight year how to crew. Uh, I cannot say enough good things about John. He's an incredible, John Gattuse his name. Uh, there's a couple of good dudes running around this town and they do a lot of endurance stuff as well. Uh, Christy Post from Fringe Lake Show Conference, Director of Market Communications. Uh, she had scouted the Eastern Terminus with me, joined me a couple days for crewing and then came back and she was one of the only people who I was able to jump on the trail and run some with me back to the car. Uh, my college roommate, Nate, this is totally not his thing, but boy, he fell into this and really was able to just enjoy the time out there. Uh, and he came all the way in from Connecticut. Uh, this is my little brother, Chris. 
typical scene at the car, and the poor guy is not exactly a morning person. Um, this was big for Chris and I. We, uh, we bonded a lot. Uh, my buddy Sean Weiser is the president of the ANF chapter of the NCT. If you go down in uh, the, a the Allegheny National Forest, the trail down there is incredible. It's a wonderful backpacking area. Uh, he does a lot of work with that chapter. And the other thing about Sean is he was tracking my progress and he decided, oh, he's ahead of time. He didn't even bother taking off work. Luckily, we didn't have an issue. Uh, my buddy Jake came up from Virginia. I don't have a photo of him, but this is the back of his truck at one point. Fog, probably early morning, I think. And then these were two crew members I did not involve. The guy in the back, Jeff Adams, he's the FDT holder for the long path. Uh, he is at fault for putting a lot of this idea in my head. <laughs> and then my other buddy, Brian Stewart, again, we didn't end up involving him, but they were on deck. Uh, the gentleman on the right here is Nathan Huckle. He does have some Rochester ties. Uh, he's the Canisius College cross country coach. The FKT holder along with the girl post the picture here, Katie Gadu, for the co-ed unsupported Northville Placid Trail. And then the gentleman who did the self-supported FKT prior to me, Ryan Levering. It was kind of neat to go, even though we went opposite directions, and look up and see his entries in all the trail registers. Not a lot of through hikers there, so it was neat to have that consistent, ongoing thing to look forward to. And then I did stay, one of the landowners has a beautiful cabin that he offers up for hikers to stay in. Uh, it was pitch black by the time I got there. I left each night, but it was awesome. And then with all the private landowners that share their property with the trail, thank you. Same for all the volunteers, maintainers, everyone. Uh, the designs for a lot of the FLTC are done by a good friend of mine, Danielle Bedezic, on uh, design shop here. She's done uh, the FLT running logo above and then my logo below. And that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, there's some contact info here. The Instagram Buffalo Trail Ultra Runners is where ongoing stuff gets posted. I, it's sort of my personal one. Uh, the Finger Lakes Trail Hikers and Friends Facebook group has day-by-day -day photos and breakdowns, everything's annotated, of the run across the trail. That's probably the best place to, to enjoy the photos and to get an idea of what day-to-day -day was. And the email here if you want to get a hold of me. And what I got? Hour five? How's that? <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. If Come on, someone's got a question. Yes? I noticed you really didn't carry much really water at all. I mean, I, I've seen trail runners with these dinky little containers on their vests and the like. And, you know, for somebody like myself who goes through regularly three or four liters of water in a day, it's hard to believe that you, you can survive with just that little liquid on you. Uh, how, how do you manage that? You just don't sweat? Is that the idea? <laughs> oh no, I sweated. I smelled lovely out there. So this is the best. Uh, it, this front's up here, but I'm not gonna struggle to do that. So there's two flasks in here. There's about a liter of water on me right now between the two of them. One would be water, one would be the electrolyte fluid. The crew was the saving grace there. They would replenish those, and they were also cold. But the great thing, it was funny, the crew, but they, the water always goes on the right, and the electrolytes on the left, and, you know, that's the type of regimen that we would get into, and we would swap those out, and always would swap that out. In addition to that, though, I did have uh, one of these with an uh, inline water filter. If I needed to, I could have stopped, and I think I only did that once or twice. So. Yeah, we, we, we've encountered some trail runners in some very remote places, and they weren't carrying anything more than you were. It was clear that... It, you know, it's, it's not like they've got a crew right behind them or something like this. And it, it's just remarkable to see.
So I've gone through a variety of water filters. Um, the first time I ran Cranberry Lake 50, uh, this type of stuff didn't exist. I carried a pump filter with me. Uh, that sucks. <laughs> it's heavy. It's, I always have backup water tablets. I've been out on runs where other people have learned the value of those very quickly. But this has been the most efficient thing that I've found. There's a filter inside here, and you can carry the water. You don't need to, you know, it's not a life straw type of thing. You don't need to pump it. You fill it up and you leave, and then you can drink. This has been a good go-to for my adventure runs where I'm supplying my own water. It varied. Uh, the, the question was how many miles between meeting up with the crew, and it depended on A, what the road access points were, what the drive between them was for them compared to how I would go. I would say five to six miles, um, sometimes less, sometimes more. I always ask the same question with these adventure stories, but did you ever consider giving up at some point? I'm looking at those pictures and I'm thinking, that's just horrific. <laughs> so the one where I was soaked, um, that was a pretty miserable day. I had gone through a bunch of thorns at that time, and then there was a big, huge bell out there at someone's front yard. And there's not a lot of community involvement. People don't even know the trail exists, but it's ring here for the FLT. And I, I'm not normally very into that type of thing. I said, you know what? what the heck? I'm going to ring it. I saw the garage door was open. So I rang the thing and nothing happened. <laughs> so then I continued on that photo of me. I went through that mess and the skating rinks with all the overgrown stuff there. The wind kicked up and this branch fell and almost clobbered me. And then I get out of bed. And I'm on a road section at this truck. He tried to pull over, but he just sprays me with water. And that's, and as negative and downtrodden as it may sound, I developed the phrase, there's no one out here, nobody cares, tomorrow will not be better. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that kept me going, because that was the expectation. It, it, there's just, there's not everyone cheering for you out here. How many folks have done Parts of the FLT. Whoa! <laughs> Do we have any on here? Twice. Twice? Twice. Okay. Wow. That's, that's huge. That, uh, wow. I, I'm amazed. That's... I'm really surprised there's so, so few people. Because you can see a lot of us do day hikes along the FLT all the time. So I'm surprised mm -hmm. Yeah, Watkins Glen, uh, Allegheny State Park, uh, and then slide, well no not slide because I went down stupid early in the morning. There were just more people out there. Did you sleep on the trail by yourself or you always had a crew to meet you? I always had a crew to meet me. Uh, I had planned to potentially camp some. We did camp out the very first night, the night prior to it, the night after I started. Um, but then we didn't end up doing that. I wouldn't have minded it if it, the crew member, they were all prepared to camp with the exception of one, but logistically, by the time we figure out where we were going to end that day, the crew might have to hike in, not only their gear, but mine too. Even at a lean to, it, it, it just didn't end up being logistically feasible. Did, you run in the dark? Did I run in the dark? Plenty, yes. That doesn't bother me. I run through the night all the time for 100 milers and whatnot. I would start off every morning in the dark uh, with the headlamp. I carried a small Petzl headlamp on me at all times after the first day when I didn't have one. We learned that lesson real quick. Um, but then I would have a bigger one as my main one. The other one was just an emergency one in the back. That's what I forgot to mention earlier. It depended on the day, of course. Uh, Mark, can you repeat the question? Yes. I woke up at 5. What time did I stop? I, I would typically run until uh, around dark every day as well, sometimes after, sometimes short of it. 
But every morning was in the dark there. I don't think there was a single morning where I had light when I started at all. Oh, Mark, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much for a great presentation. Some stuff over at the table here. There's some magazines, the FLT News, some stickers, coasters, my big pink book, miscellaneous stuff. Some antlers, everyone likes to play with those. And ice cream axes. <laughs>